Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope you enjoyed uh, your workshops and the symposia earlier, and thanks for um, returning promptly. Um, for those of you who weren't in earlier sessions, my name's Catherine Scott, and I am the Director of Policy here at the BPS. I'm delighted to welcome to the stage our um, next keynote speaker, who is Professor Eldar Shafir. And he's going to be delivering his keynote on psychology and policy in contexts of scarcity. Professor Shafir is inaugural director of the Kahneman Treisman Center for Behavioral Science and Public Policy, as well as being a professor of psychology and public affairs at Princeton. And he's also a visiting professor at the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford. Amongst other things, his research looks at how the psychological experience of scarcity can act as a drain on our mental resources. Whether it's worrying about bills, paying rent, or filling in forms to claim benefits, all of these leave us with less cognitive bandwidth or capacity to make decisions and plans in other areas of our lives. The mindset that scarcity can induce has far-reaching consequences for individuals and scarcity as a whole. His research is um, especially relevant here in the UK. In recent years, in-work poverty has increased at a rate faster than employment, with four million people experiencing in-work poverty. The society has expressed concerns about the excessive burden placed on people also claiming out-of-work benefits. Thankfully, Professor Shafir also undertakes work looking into how these insights and other psychological evidence can be used to improve policymaking and hopefully people's well-being. This resonates strongly with our ongoing work at the British Psychological Society as we advocate for more psychologically informed policymaking in all areas of government. So I'm sure you'll join me in welcoming Professor Shafir to hear more about how we can be attuned to the experience of scarcity and use psychological research to develop policies to help people most at risk from its impacts. Professor Shafir. Thank you. It's, it's great to be here. Um, what I'm going to try to do is give you a bit of a sense uh, of the research we've done in recent years on issues related to scarcity and the mindset that occur in cases of scarcity. And then I want to focus, uh, as Catherine mentioned, a little bit on policy implications, partly uh, as a call for all of you to be, if you're interested, to get more involved in policy issues, because I think uh, these days, particularly as everything else seems to be failing, uh, there's more and more an opening to uh, an interest and a willingness to listen to behavioral insights, even more in Europe, I think, than certainly more in the US now, but more generally. Uh, in ways that I think uh, many of you can, should think about and, and consider because our insights could be uh, highly relevant. We, we start, I, the, my main work in scarcity was, uh, was done with uh, a colleague, an economist, uh, Sandal Mulanathan, and we started really, um, Sandal was doing development economics work, I was doing decision making work, and we realized that nobody was looking at decision making in context of poverty. And you know, we psychologists have, are the ones who discovered the importance of context. And the, and the poverty context is a massively powerful context. And if you look at poverty, one thing you find uh, is that the poor behave badly. And by that, what I mean is if you look at the world of, of health, uh, we've developed many important drugs. What remains now is for people to take them. Adherence is a problem in medicine. And it's been repeatedly observed that the poor are the biggest culprits. They, even when you adjust for liquidity and accessibility and everything else, they fail to take their medications on time. Uh, if you move all the way to, the, to weeding in the developing world, weeding increases your income significantly. Uh, agriculturalists have observed that poor farmers weed their fields less than farmer, richer farmers next to them. Uh, parenting, there's an infinite number of books criticizing the poor. They're inconsistent parents, inattentive parents, all kinds of stuff. Uh, in finance, it's almost infinite. The poor seem to be behaving very badly. Uh, the one that I've spent the most time on, and actually, uh, I think from what I, from some of you here might correct me later, but I think the UK is about as bad as the US. Uh, we offer payday loans that are highly unregulated. The way payday loans work is you, you have to be working to get a payday loan. You basically pay with a, for, with a future check. You're running out of uh, money before the end of the month, and you need 200 pounds. And you go and you borrow 200 pounds from a payday lender, and you basically give them back two weeks later when you get paid uh, 250. And the implied interest rate can be somewhere between 500 and 1,000%. Uh, it's a disaster. If you ask, ask yourself, if I can't 
finish the month this month and I need 200, how will I have 250 next month? If you win the lottery, you're okay, but otherwise you have to take a payday loan to pay back the payday loan, and the average payday loan taker takes between 10 and 15 payday loans a year. Uh, the last statistic I saw in the U.S. was about, if you take a random payday loan given in the U.S. today, 70, 70% 7 of it goes to pay the previous loan. So you've turned the poor into money pumps at a high expense. It all looks terribly myopic. What did you think was gonna happen? And things of that sort have been, have been discussed again and again, suggesting that the poor are not planning well, not thinking clearly, and making mistakes. So that's the world in which if you study poverty, that's the things you find, like you know, bad behaviors everywhere. And the question was, what's going on? The way we describe it, there are really two, I mean, there's obviously a continuum, but there's two extreme ends to this attempt to explain it. On the one hand, it's kind of the standard rational choice analysis that says, you know, the poor are calculating, they'll do the best they can. If you increase child benefits, they'll have more children. If you diminish them, they'll have less. Very rational calculation. On the other side, there's kind of a, other side is sort of a culture of poverty, pathology, lack of planning, lack of understanding, lack of self-control, that kind of stuff. And when we came, we said, look, we don't think people are perfectly rational in any case, and it doesn't seem like the poor are particularly pathological. What if basically we apply a different lens and try to understand the behavior of the poor as just the kind of behaviors that we all of us study every day, somewhat inconsistent, sometimes present focused, the kind of things that we see every day. Could that make sense of what we're seeing? That was the initial agenda. So the idea was to basically show that the psychology of the poor is just like anybody else's. And in some sense, that's what we got, but we got something extra, and that's what I want to describe to you today, which is that poverty, I'm going to say scarcity, because we suggested at some point, I'll mention it very briefly, it doesn't have to be only in money. You can be poor in time, you can be other things, you can be lonely. But when you experience a scarcity that's very critical, that you're missing some very critical resource that you need, a lot of your mind basically gets allocated to juggling this insufficient resource. You're spending a lot of your mind dealing with this element of scarcity. And when you devote a lot of your mental resources to dealing with this element of scarcity, there is just less mind left for other stuff. And when I put you with less mind left in other stuff in the relatively difficult context of scarcity, bad things happen. Because that's basically the story of our book. And I'll try to give you a few glimpses of how that works. I want to say, uh, just to make sure that this is clear, I'm not suggesting that our analysis of scarcity replaces everything else. A lot of important work has been done on neighborhoods and peer effects and other things. Uh, you heard some of it this morning where the attempt here is not to replace it, it's just to say, let's put all this aside for a moment and just focus for, for, for 45 minutes on the psychology that arises in context of poverty and the behaviors that it might lead to, that it might explain. Okay, that, that's, the, that's the plan. Now, to get one thing out of the way, uh, maybe in this, in this context it's less important, but it, I encounter it often. So when you talk about studying poverty in the US or in the UK, there's always those who say, you know, what do you mean poverty? You know, the poor in the UK, the US, they're living well. If you, you know, if you put them in India, they'd be middle class. So I want to, I, I understand where it comes from. It's profoundly misguided, but I get it. So let's just t touch it on for a moment. In the US, you regularly have these sort of analyses that show how good the poor have it. How many of them air conditioning? How many of them have uh, microwave ovens? You know, what, what are we even talking? It obviously comes usually from the right. And what exactly are we talking about? Um, the most recent one was done by the Heritage Foundation a few years ago, again, counting air conditioning and, and TVs. Uh, they talk about how many of them have color TVs, as if you could buy black and white if you wanted to, but anyway. Um, and when this is, what's interesting is when this is published every time, it's published again and again, and all the, all the newspapers announce it, but nobody says to you, what am, what am I supposed to make of this? What does it tell me exactly? Uh, except for the you know, deep observ observers of the American scene. So Steve Colbert, as a TV comic, you might know him, says this report proves the poor are not living down to our expectations. If you still have the strength to brush the flies off your eyeballs, you're not really poor. This is Colbert's vulgar way of saying exactly what the Heritage Foundation implies. Uh, John Stewart, another well-known comic, I've never realized the poor have it so good in this country, no wonder the middle class is pouring into their ranks and droves. 
And basically the idea is, you know, what are we supposed to make of it? And, you know, 350 years earlier, Adam Smith, in his inimitable style, solves the problem very clearly. He says, it used to be the case that a British laborer did not have to wear a linen shirt to go to work. Now that you're expected to wear it, if you can't afford it, you're poor. And this is what we're going to call poverty. Poverty doesn't have to have anything to do with starvation or having flies on your eyeballs. It has to do with not being able to live the minimally acceptable life in a time and place in which you live. And if minimum, of course, the minimally acceptable life changes with time. It would be ridiculous if I came to you and said, now, you know, 400 years ago, nobody had running water. Now that you have a faucet, what are you complaining about? Times change. Even internet, which 20 minutes ago was an impossible dream, now that schools assume your child has internet to access her homework, if she doesn't have it, she's poor. And that's it. So poverty here is going to be basically not being able to live the minimally acceptable life in the time and place in which you live. Um, has important implications, by the way, when I show you later data on the poor. Um, and by the way, I'm going to use the, poor, the, word, the word the poor. It's a pretty vulgar term. What exactly does that mean? Some of us have been poor. Some of us may be poor. You know, it's, nobody knows exactly, but you get the idea. It's something like the financially uh, challenged. But when I talk about the poor later, don't have in mind uh, some person who's abjectly poor in the corner, homeless. We're talking about 120 million Americans, about a third of the US. I don't know exactly where it is in the UK. These are people who basically cannot finish the month. Many of them are working very hard. Many times they're working very hard more than one job. They just cannot finish the month, and it's them whose mental resources are allocating to the juggling of this insufficient resource and the challenges that it brings. Okay, so that's, that's we're talking a lot of people. Now, um, we started a metaphor that some people found useful, so I'll do it very quickly here. We talk about a packing problem. You, your, your suitcase is your budget. You travel through life with a, with a budget, with a suitcase. Some of us have big suitcases where everything fits and there's some slack. Otherwise, our, others are traveling with a very tight suitcase. There's actually beautiful research on computational theory that's known as a packing problem, which is actually fitting items into a smaller bucket basically is computationally more challenging. The idea basically is imagine you're going for, you know, for the weekend to Paris, you throw your giant suitcase on the bed, you start throwing things in, <clears throat> you're not gonna take everything that's in the house. Let's assume you're throwing in things in decreasing order of importance. After 10 or 12 things, you have everything you need, you haven't had to spend too much time on it, you close your suitcase, there's some room left in case you forgot something and you want to buy something, you're easy, it's ready. Imagine doing the same thing with a very small suitcase. You start tossing things in, by thing four or five, you're running out of space. You have to stop everything else you're doing and focus. You have to ask yourself what takes more room, the boots or the coat. You become an expert in how much space things take. Once you leave with a very tight suitcase, if you misplanned anything, no room to put something else, you have to take something out, you're in trade-off thinking mode. That's kind of the idea of traveling with a small budget. And in fact, if you look at the poor, they're very good, very good at small budgets. They know exactly how much room things take, how much they cost. Uh, they think trade-offs all the time with a lot of data, whether it's the US or India. People think trade-offs a lot. It's kind of interesting. If, you, if you're kind of a good economist, there's always a trade-off. Even if you're Gates, if you spend $1,000, those are $1,000 your son will not have in his inheritance. There's always a trade-off. Psychologically, that's just not the case. For many people in this room, when you go out for a lunch with a friend or you buy a book or a CD, you don't ask yourself, well, what will I not buy instead? It's as if you're reaching into a small bucket of infinite expenses. The person who sells you the coffee often does ask him or herself, well, what will I not buy instead if I go to lunch with a friend? So trade-off thinking is much more common. It's constantly happening in the minds of those who are juggling insufficient resources. All of us will have it if we decide to buy a Lamborghini, but for everyday small stuff, the poor experience it a lot more often. Um, if you st simply stand outside of a supermarket and ask people, can I see your receipt? How much did you spend today in the supermarket? How much did you spend on the pasta, on the juice? The, a lot of marketing research. The poor know the answer is a lot better than the rich. Uh, we did a really fun study in uh, South Station in Boston. When people came out of the, of the train station, we asked them for you know, estimated annual in income, and then asked them, when you get into a taxi in Boston, what does the meter read initially? It's a fun question, because clearly the rich take taxis much more often than the poor, but they're much less likely to know the answer. So the, the mental image I want to leave you with on this slide is, 
The rich get into the taxi, sit back, and enjoy how beautiful the Charles River looks today. The poor are staring at the meter. That's where their attention is going. And they become experts at the cost, at the trade-off. That's where they are. Um, we learned, by the way, one of the things we learned that was very fun uh, is known as a quantity surcharge. Mar marketers estimate that up to 25% of items in good neighborhoods in the US exhibit quantity surcharge. Quantity surcharge is when you go buy spinach, uh, half a kilo costs $5 and a kilo costs 12. Now, if you're listening to me, you should say, no, no, you're confused, and that's exactly the point. They know that you assume that the bigger packages cost less per unit item. So you, the rich person who couldn't really spend too much time focusing, just grab the bigger item, leave, and give the company a $2 gift. What they find out is that the quantity surcharge cannot be found. It's absent in, in low-income neighborhoods. The poor go in and they check and they see that two half kilos cost less than a kilo, and they buy two half kilos. They just don't fall for it. They're attentive, they're careful, they're thoughtful, and don't fall for little marketing tricks. And there's quite a bit of data on marketing tricks that the comfortable fall into all the time and the poor avoid. So they're very attentive. They're focusing, we call this tunneling. They're tunneling on the urgent, on what they need to juggle and the things that need their full attention. And while they're tunneling on what's urgent, there are other things that they realize are important, but they're at the periphery, they're outside your tunnel. They're left for another time. And that's gonna cause the classic, you know, focusing and myopia that you see. Uh, I, I can't resist a couple of studies that we've reviewed just to tell you. This is a, this is a study that if you do nutrition, everybody knows about it. And if you don't do nutrition, pretty much nobody knows about it. This is a study where the Allied forces in 1943-44 realized they're going to inherit a lot of starving people in European camps and didn't know how to feed the starving. So in the US, they assigned Ansel Keys, a leading nutritionist at the time in Minnesota, the task of study how to feed the starving. Uh, in order to feed the starving, he had to starve people. He got a, a group of conscientious objectors because they were objecting to the good war. They were eager to help. These are a group of very talented, highly educated, impressive young men who volunteered to starve. Not to death, but to massive discomfort. The, the physical descriptions are quite remarkable. These guys cannot hold their arms above their heads long enough to wash their hair. They're so weak. They need pillows to sit down. There's no padding left. But we looked at the mental descriptions, and what's very clear is that these guys are starving. The last thing we want to do is think about food. They're very highly educated, they're very talented. All they do, all day long, is think and talk about food. They literally plan to open restaurants, they memorize recipes, they compare prices of food in different magazines, that's where they are. And when at some point the experimenters feel bad and decide to show them a movie, the testimonial from the participants is, they showed us a movie, I couldn't care less about the love scenes, I wanted to see the meals. And so that's where they are, and this is kind of important, because when you experience this insufficient, this scarcity, your mind is there both when you think fast and when you think slow, both in terms of what you think of intuitively and what you choose to talk about. That's where you are. And I don't have to spend too much time in this format, in this uh, room, but basically we have very limited bandwidth. This is something that is a classic thing we fail to appreciate. Our ability to attend to multiple things is ridiculously limited. All those, I don't know if you've followed the research, for example, on using cell phones in cars. There's a lot of work, simulation work right now. It's got nothing to do with your hands, which is the only thing you can sell the public. If you're using a cell phone in the car, non-hands held, your reaction time and your ability to detect the periphery compared to somebody who is legally drunk in the US is a major effect. And there's a lot of other work. <clears throat> so when you're focusing and thinking so much of this thing you're managing, other stuff just loses because of limited bandwidth. We encountered this uh, beautiful study that was done by sociologists in Connecticut. This is a school that happened to have divided the kids in elementary school into two classrooms. One happens to be in the quiet side of the school, and the other one uh, is near a window near the train tracks. And at certain times of the day, the train goes outside this classroom. Do we think trains are distracting? Yeah, they're distracting. How distracting are they? They found that in fifth grade, the kids on the train side of the school are one year behind in academic performance. That's a massive effect. They install soundproofing, the kids catch up, the classic story. And what I wanna, another image I wanna leave you with is imagine yourself now in a very quiet room, no trains outside. You're trying to com compute or do some cognitively challenging task and concerns about being evicted on Monday or lunch for your kids on Friday 
or how you're going to fund for a school trip go through your head. Those are internal trains. It doesn't have to be outside the room for you to be affected, impacted by this in ways that are very, very challenging. Okay, and we can talk more about this. It's interesting. Many of us have problems in our lives, but most of us are lucky enough to be able to leave them aside for 45 minutes or an hour and do what we're doing now. We know that if you had a major fight with your partner this morning or if you left a sick child at home, you might actually function less well today. And poverty does that to you pretty much full time. So this is the scarcity as a source of uh, cognitive capacity I want to talk about. As I mentioned, in the book we talk about other things. So it turns out that many people in this room, for example, are time poor in ways that are quite reminiscent of how our subjects are, are money poor. If I ask you, you want to go to the movies tonight, you might say, what's the movie and what will I not do tonight that I have to do tomorrow? You're in trade-off thinking mode in a way that you wouldn't be if you were less busy. Uh, similarly, for temptation, I'm not going to go into this, but there's a lot of similarities between how the busy juggle time and the poor juggle money that are at least interesting. Uh, but back to our research, so this is a classic study, not by us, where we have subject, yeah, people have subjects come to the room after had nothing to drink for four hours, so they're thirsty. By random assignment, half of them get water, the other half get pretzels, which is not a good idea when you're thirsty. <clears throat> and then your task is to do the classic word identification task. And what you find is that those who just had pretzels identify thirst-related words significantly faster than those who had water uh, compared to controls. This is nice because these are, you know, three, 400 millisecond decisions. It's clear here that when you're experiencing scarcity, for example, thirst, it's literally activated in your semantic network at levels of, you know, almost pre-decision leads. You're literally walking around with your brain activated for thirst or for hunger in the case of the Ansel Key studies, et cetera. And when your activated system is searching for the thing that's scarce, other stuff gets interfered, get, loses. This is a nice study where they take a group of people who have retirement concerns and another group of equal age that do not have retirement concerns. They give them a simple Stroop test. And what you find is that <clears throat> both groups say blue equally quickly, but those who have retirement concerns are significantly slower to say red than those who do not have retirement concerns. Literal interference of just the things that are preoccupying you uh, in real time. And this is what led us to some of our studies. I'll just give you a description of a couple. This is done in a mall in New Jersey. We ask people to participate in a study. We pay them, they send from the computer, and we'll give them scenarios that are very close to financial challenges that they experience every day. It's like your car breaks down, it's gonna cost you X amount of dollars to fix. All the scenarios come in two versions, called the manageable and challenging. The manageable version, it's going to cost you $150 to fix the car, which we know for most people in the mall that Saturday is manageable. In the challenging version, it's going to cost you $1,500 to fix the car, which we know for many people in the mall is a massive challenge. As you're going through these scenarios and thinking what, how you're going to take care of them, just to make things interesting, we'll let you play some games, and then you tell us what you're going to do. These games, many of you will recognize, are classic cognitive psych type tests. So we have sort of the you know, go, no go test, divided attention test, consider it a driving test, and the Raven's matrices, which is the standard, the most common fluid intelligence test and any form of IQ test. And then we look at how people do. We divide the participants by median split into high and low income, call them rich and poor, and we look at how they do when they're dealing with these financial challenges. So um, <clears throat> here are the rich when they're taking care of um, the poor and the, and the, the easy and the, and the challenging car, so the green and orange, what well, you see that in this task, in the divided attention task, the rich do just as well whether they're worried about the 1,500 or the $150 car, no difference. If you look at the poor, the poor look identical to the rich friends when they're worried about the $150 car, but they lose divided attention, they drive less well when they're worried about the $1,500 car. Similarly, if you go to the fluid intelligence test, um, <clears throat> the rich uh, don't care how they're doing. Uh, where am I? There we go. The rich do just as well in fluid intelligence whether they're worried about the manageable or challenging car. The poor do significantly less well when they're trying to fix the challenging car. This is a big effect. It's close to standard deviation. We replicated it four times. If you assume standard assumptions about the distribution of the IQ score, these guys who a minute ago were just as good as their rich friends 
have now lost about 13 IQ points. 13 IQ points in a school where my kids go, in a public school at Princeton, that's enough on a qualitative scale to take you from average to borderline deficient or from average to borderline gifted. It's a big effect. We know from other studies, if I kept you up all night, you know, with M&M blasting in the background, you would be about nine IQ points less capable today. So think how you would feel after a night of no sleep. These guys who a minute ago were just as good as their rich friends are now massively distracted. Um, we took care of everything here, but these are rich and poor Americans, and they differ in some ways. They have different heart rates, different education. Maybe there is something going on at an interaction. The dreamers can do this within subjects. It's not easy to do this within subjects because you need them to be rich and poor. But we did find a group. These are sugarcane farmers in India. Because sugarcane farming harvesting happens once a year, these are people who 70, at least 70% of their income happens in one day, basically. So these are, because they fail to smooth, they run out of money too quickly, these are people who are rich after harvest and poor before. So we run them four months apart, two months before, two months after harvest on handheld devices in the field, very similar to the tests you just saw. And if you look at reaction times and errors, they're functioning nine to 10 IQ points less capable during scarcity than during plenty. This is the same person, same education, same heart rate, everything else. We're, just, we're able to control almost for everything, not for sleep. Um, Okay, we did a lot of other studies. Uh, this is a classic memory study you've all seen before. I show you these words, and then I take them away, and I ask you, did you see the word man? And although man is not on the list, because there's a lot of words on this list that are associated with man, people remember that they saw man, although it wasn't there, about 20% of the time. Okay, so that's a classic old study. We run the poor and the rich. They do just, we replicate it in both. About nearly 20% think they saw man when there was no man there. But then we'll do it again with words that have to do with money. So rent, phone, coin, bills, expense, utilities, et cetera. And then we ask people, did you see the word money? And the rich did not see money and the poor did. It's another way of saying you're walking around and money is just in your face, on your mind, if you're poor, not if you're rich. That's what's occupying you basically full time. Um, <clears throat> we'll do another study where we invite people to just mind, wander in the in, on the beach for a minute, please imagine what it would be like to touch the sand, to feel the wind, to enjoy the water. And then we're gonna, at certain point, flash words on the screen. They're either finance related, beach related, or non-words. I'm not gonna spend much time. Basically what you find, compared to the rich, the poor are faster on money words. They're much slower on beach related words. They're basically unable to get lost on the beach. They, they're not faster on beach related words. They're not enjoying the task. They report being more distracted. The invitation to, to spend a moment on the beach does not work uh, when you're worried about finances, which we have asked some questions about before the, the study begins. Okay, so again and again. Um, this is probably the most satisfying study I've ever run. These are Princeton undergraduates. Uh, it's hard to make them poor in money, but it's easier to make them poor or rich in time. So we have them come to the lab, we assign them a random assignment, either poor or rich in time. They either have 15 seconds or 50 seconds big difference. They're playing family feud, which they're dying to get to do well on. They get paid according to how well they do, so they're massively incentivized to do well. And what we do is we divide them by random assignment into rich and poor, how much time they have. And in addition, crossed with that, they either have no option to borrow, so when they run out of a round, they move to the next one. Or, if they're in the other condition, if they need a few more seconds, they can borrow a few extra seconds at predatory lending rates. Every second you take costs you two seconds from the bucket of time you have available. It's a payday loan of sort. Uh, and what you see here, this is how well they do without the ability to borrow. And not surprising, the rich do better than the poor. They should be doing a lot better than they're doing. There's a whole other set of analyses that show that when you're poor, you're focused and you're efficient. When you're rich, you're sitting back and wasting time, but we'll leave that aside. Let's now let them borrow. Let's give them the option to borrow. When you give the rich the option to borrow, since they're pretty comfortable, they're looking to say, I don't want this expensive loan, I'm not interested. But when they're poor and they think they know the answer to number two and they just need two more seconds, they grab the two seconds, they lose four seconds and they leave the lab with significantly less money. Now, why is this so satisfying? Because this is, I'm getting Princeton undergraduates, not your perfect candidate for a myopic, uneducated person to be very intelligent and avoid payday loans when they have enough, and to grab payday loans the minute they're in a moment of scarcity. And so this is kind of a way of saying, there's nothing special about being myopic about loans other than not having enough. 
And that, if I put you in that context, you who a moment ago looked really, really thoughtful, you start looking myopic. Um, this says air traffic control. This is a beautiful study that was done on air traffic controllers. It's a good population because you have easy and hard days basically determined randomly by weather conditions and traffic. Sociologists sit in these people's living rooms for weeks and gauge their interaction with their spouses and their children. And what they find basically is that these air traffic controllers are more attentive parents and better spouses on easy than on difficult days. Okay, another way of controlling for context where it's the scarcity that induces a certain set of behaviors. There is generally a real irony to being in context of scarcity. Um, when you don't have enough, the decisions you have to make are more complicated, more challenging, and they cost you a lot more when they go wrong. And a lot of conspires against you. So everything is going to turn the wrong way in some sense because everything counts more, is more difficult, and you're getting less help. Um, you're getting a lot less help. I mean, I don't know how much time we'll have to spend on it today, but many people in this room fail to appreciate how much help you get, whether it's a cooperative bank that does automatic deposits and payments, whether it's your lawyer, your accountant, your gardener, your driver, your nanny, whatever it is. If you go down the SES scale, as you go lower towards scarcity, those are people who need the help a lot more and get none of it. And when they get the lawyer, it's an untrustworthy lawyer. At least in the US, it's a total disaster. And so basically what you have is, is as you go down the scale and need more help, you get less of it, and often you get sabotaged. Um, and when you think about policy this way, it has some really interesting implications. Uh, I won't go through all of them. But for one thing, the scarcity that you experience is not just a function of your income. It's really a function of the difficulty of juggling. If you have two people with equal income, and one of them gets a reliable bank and a reliable lawyer and, and, and reliable transportation, their juggling act, their scarcity challenge is significantly reduced relative to the one who has to worry about this stuff every day. And that's something that's not really appreciated. Even, I think even businesses, if, if you look at, I don't know how it works here, but in the US, McDonald's gives you your working hours about 48 hours in advance. So on Monday, you're told when you're working Wednesday, Thursday. If you're a mother of kids, you're in a constant, unending, permanent child management crisis mode. If they give you a schedule two weeks in advance, you could plan it ahead. And what McDonald's doesn't understand, and all the data suggests, is that if they did that, they'd get workers who are simply happier, sleep better, and make less mistakes. It would be self-serving if they got it, as far as I can tell. So institutions in context, governments and non-for-profits and others can influence the scarcity that people experience and make them better or worse. In general, one, thing that's implica one implication that's interesting is if you have somebody who's experiencing scarcity in money, they're also experiencing scarcity in bandwidth. And that's not something we often think about. If, I, if you look at a lot of very well-intentioned non-for-profits, what we often do is say to people, you need to be there at 8 in the morning, sharp. If you come at 8.20, you will not be seen. We often confuse an attempt to educate people with an attempt to help them. When you tell a struggling, low-income person you have to be there at 8, it's like charging them $200 when they come for a loan. They don't have the bandwidth to do that. They have unreliable buses. They don't have a babysitter. The, the kid may not have felt well that morning. What you need to do is the opposite. Come any time this morning, we'll see you. Remove the tax on their bandwidth, which they don't have enough of, when you want to help them. So this is something that we need to think a lot more about. What are the taxes that are imposed, the psychic taxes on my bandwidth that are imposed by the programs that we, that we create? We want to be much more fault tolerant. By that, I mean the fault is not the person doesn't care or, or, or didn't plan well. It's because it's just difficult juggling. Um, smoothing is an important one because the financial juggling is incessant. In some cases, paying people weekly will be better than monthly, and this gets into some really interesting technical propositions there. Think about the payday loan taker who comes and run, runs out of money week three. You owe them three weeks of pay, and now they have to go and borrow because you're not paying it yet. This whole thing is a little bit crazy, but in any case. Um, but then come issues like training programs which require a lot of bandwidth. And now we have to ask ourselves, are they working or not? I have a real, um, this is a long 
peeve of mine, and I've talked to a lot of people. So in the US, we spent a lot of money and time on financial literacy training. Now, I'm careful here because everybody who does this is well-intentioned. I like them, I respect them, but here is a problem. If you look at the financial literacy training, there was, uh, recently there was a meta-analysis of 200 studies in the US. What you find is if you give people a good financial literacy training course, they pass the tests better, they answer the questions better, and it has zero impact on their lives. And this is important. Imagine I teach you Swimming 101, and I throw you into a little Geneva lake, and look, you learned, it's wonderful. Now imagine I teach you Swimming 101, and I throw you into a massively stormy ocean. You drown. When you take the American poor in a massively unregulated, violent, vulgar American marketing system, economic system, and teach them financial literacy, and then toss them into the American system, they drown. But if that's the case, why are we spending time teaching them? They should just be sitting in the back room reading Oscar Wilde with their children. You're wasting their time if there's no effect on their finances. And this is a, challenge, this is a problem we have to face seriously because the intentions are good, but there's no benefit to the patient, to the client, who is spending so much time and effort and get demeaned by them not succeeding. It brings a whole other set of issues. Similarly for messaging, how do you message people if their bandwidth is limited, if the heads are occupied? It becomes an interesting question. So we know from work on influence that I can get to you through your central processor. I need you to stop other things you're doing, listen to me, weigh the arguments I'm presenting, and I need your attention. Or if I'm preoccupied and you're busy and doing other things, I can get to you peripherally. I can put a Coca-Cola poster and you're not even noticing it, but you leave the room and you have an urge for a Coke. That's two ways to get to you. Now, what picture do we put on the wall to give people the urge to save for retirement? Nobody has found one. So if you look at ads for retirement savings, it looks like this. You have to stop everything you do and get a little master's degree in savings for retirement. It takes all of your attention, which you don't have. Now imagine instead I want to get you to smoke. If I want to get you to smoke, I don't want your central processor. You want to be busy. I'm going to flash pictures on the walls of you know, beautiful people Italian villas, you know, a gun or two if you're in the U.S. can give people the urge. And next you know, you're smoking. So what gets to people when their heads are busy is going to change accordingly. And so what we discussed toward the end of the book is think about it as a cockpit. And I like the cockpit metaphor because responsibility is a big thing. And the cockpit metaphor is a good, is a good metaphor. In the world of aviation, it's very clear. If you design cockpits badly, well-trained, well-intentioned pilots will kill themselves. So you take people who, who want well, who are capable, and who work hard, and now you owe them a well-designed cockpit. If you give them a well-designed cockpit, they can soar. If you don't, they'll crash. And that's what we need to think about when we design cockpits for people who are functioning with limited bandwidth. Um, it has another interesting implication if you think about program evaluation, which I think people haven't quite grasped yet. The limited bandwidth we're talking about here is the one you use to do your finances, remember to eat healthy, help your kids with their homework, that's the only limited bandwidth you have. Now imagine that the, the Ministry of Finance designs a new banking instrument that makes your financial lives a bit easier. What do we typically do? We introduce this instrument, we'll wait two years and go to look at how people are doing financially. But this is a different implication. If I'm juggling too much with limited bandwidth and you've given me a really nice instrument to help me with my finances, I might say, thanks so much. Now I have to devote less bandwidth to my finances. I can devote more, more of it to my kids' homework. But that means that two years later, the effect is going to be not my finances, it's going to be my kids' grades. And that's not how we evaluate programs typically. And we may be missing an enormous amount of effects that are important by looking at the place where we've touched, which is exactly the place where you'd expect limited bandwidth clients to spend least attention now that you made it easier and go elsewhere instead. Uh, last few comments. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of work. There's a, it's a different talk, but basically, once we've understood the context of poverty and how difficult it is, what's remarkable is that instead of respect for the juggling and the difficulty, people get disrespected, and instead of help, they get sabotaged in today's policy world. The difficulties, I don't have to tell you, but they're multifaceted, and they, they meet in many different ways and they're massive, and they're serious. And people often, you know, what we typically do, of course, is we study one at a time. 
There's a beautiful metaphor that comes out of some uh, feminist writings that talks about a birdcage. And they explain, this is in the context of feminism, but it applies here perfectly, if you focus very, very carefully on one bar of the, of the cage, you might say to yourself, oh, look at that bar, the bird can just fly around it. It's only when you step back and look at all the bars you realize the bird has no place to go. This is a little bit like this. If you spend all your time on schools, you might think, ah, oh, if we fix a few things, they'll fly around it. Not so easy. There's a lot of bars to this cage, all of which are keeping people trapped in ways that are pretty, pretty powerful. And then, uh, I don't know the British scene as well, so I apologize, but in the American scene, at least, the angry obstacles that we erect along the ways that punish people who are struggling and not succeeding are truly remarkable. And what worries me, I mean, there is some data on Europe versus the US. You guys looked a lot better than the US in terms of understanding that, you know, kind of there but for the grace of God go I idea. Unfortunately, instead of the US coming your way, you're sort of moving our way, and that's a bit of a concern. Um, we know about this respect of, so this is uh, my colleague Susan Fisk's work. If you look at stereotypes around the world, there are places where it's better or less good to be Roma or Jewish or black. Being homeless and poor is a disaster everywhere universally. You're unreliable, untrustworthy, incapable, it's universal, and it's very powerful. We just ran a study recently that I'm, I, I like so much, I'll show you one quick illustration. Here's a guy, he's wearing a shirt, he's wearing clothes that are judged by independent judges to be poorer than these clothes. But this is not about race, we do blacks, whites, Asians. This guy's wearing a shirt that independent judges agree is richer than this shirt. One thing I learned, by the way, in case it matters to you, that wearing Hawaiian shirts makes you look poor for whatever reasons. And the only thing we ask people is, how competent is this person? They see the identical face with just slightly different clothing, nothing torn, nothing ragged, just different clothes. How competent is this person? And we do this notice, if you give them a full second, which feels an eternity, or 70 milliseconds, that's basically pre-effort decisional, same judgments. And when the exact same face wears a slightly richer shirt, they're more competent two points out of a 10 point scale. So basically, the first impression which takes about a tenth of a second. If you're wearing less rich looking clothes, you already start by looking less competent. And that's just one of many, many things that we know happens uh, in the stereotyping of the poor. Um, this is a beautiful, very old quote where uh, the head of the American Economic Association basically says, if you do anything where human behavior matters, you better understand what drives people. You can make it up on your own, but it will be bad psychology. I have a whole collection of bad psychologies. I'll just give you a couple because we want to stop quickly. Take uh, Pareto optimality. So many of you might know Pareto optimality is a beautiful idea that the Italian economist Pareto introduced. And it says, if, so, if there is a state of the world where some of us are better off and nobody is worse off, that's a better place to be. This idea is logically unassailable, clearly true, but it may not be true in pounds or in dollars or in yens. What do I mean by that? There's plenty of evidence now suggesting that if I gave these lovely 20 people in the room a 100% raise and everybody else got 2% or for that matter nothing, no raise, well-being in this room will have gone down. And that means that Pareto wasn't wrong, but it's not, it doesn't work in dollars. Because it turns out that it didn't have to be this way, but we were organisms whose well-being is just not just by how much we make, but how much we make relative to others who we deem equally meritorious. And there's a lot of work now showing that if you do GDP and do not count inequality in it, you might just be missing the whole point. And a recent study suggests basically that if inequality is low, GDP does in fact value well-being. If inequality is high, it does not. And this is a clearly, you know, it just may be the wrong psychology about how to gauge societal well-being that we've missed. I'm going to skip this. I'm going to skip this. Um, last one. Uh, emergency room in Ontario. The homeless come into the emergency room. It's a big problem because they hang out in the emergency room. It's not pleasant. The physicians, the nurses, it's a good population because they clearly mean well have to stop this, they say, look, it's cold outside, we're gonna give them a cup of tea, let's be less nice so they come less often. And this is an ongoing losing battle until Redelmeyer, a wonderful physician in Canada, gets the inclination there may be something wrong here after some interviews and he runs a randomized control study 
where when the homeless come in, by random assignment, they get the standard treatment as always, or they get a compassionate treatment. An intern is attached to the homeless person, ask how they can help them, what's wrong with them, what can they do for them, super warm and nice. And the finding is very clear, those who get the compassionate treatment are significantly less likely to come back to this or any other hospital in the province. And the point is that when you're homeless and you come in with a non-life-threatening disease, your, your knee hurts, your elbow hurts, if you feel somebody took good care of you, you have no interest in coming back. But if you feel people ignored you, you come again to this or another hospital. And so all this time, these physicians, if they had just been nicer, they would have solved a problem that they could not solve by being tough. And that's bad psychology. And so in that sense, there's a lot of place to work in policymaking where if we understand the drivers of people better, whether it's the bandwidth or the things that drive them to come and go, we can conduct and create much more effective policy. And if you believe these things, which all our nations signed, we actually have an obligation to do this once we understand what's happening. Okay, I'll stop here and wait a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much for that talk. Um, lots of implications there for my team working on policy in the UK. Um, so we've got a few minutes for questions. Um, I've already seen one from Sally over there by number two. Um, anybody else with a question? Okay, we'll go with Sally. Thanks. I can make it two. To if it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> no, I'll be quick. Um, hi, that was amazing. Thank you. And I, I've read your book and it's, it's really interesting. Um, I... There's two comments, I suppose. One is, it's interesting, I'm a community psychologist alongside being a clinical psychologist, and we do part, a lot of participatory research, and it's interesting, a lot of these things come up naturally just by working in participation with, I work with young people, deprived young people in London, and you can, have, you can find out all this stuff through, and we've known a lot of these things about the impact of poverty on, on people's lives and on their cognition and thinking by being alongside them and working in partnership with them and designing things with them. Um, but it's interesting what it takes in terms of positivist science to get that message out there. And I'm not saying that's a bad, bad thing that it's done, but it's interesting, isn't it, about how much that's required. The, but that's one comment. But my other comment is we're also, I'm also part with my colleague here of, of a group called Psychologists for Social Change. We've been working on um, social change issues and, and campaigning. And we've written a briefing paper about um, the impact, the possible psychological impact of the universal basic income. And uh, we were, one of one of many arguments was that perhaps it has the capacity to relieve people from scarcity. And I wondered if you, um, and therefore it could be a really positive thing. Um, and I wondered if you'd done any work around universal basic income or if you agreed with that analysis. Okay, thank you for that. Um, is this working? So. Um, the first one, I, I think you may be atypical. When you say that you look at the kids you work with and you can see it, I worry that many of us can't see it. I worry that you know we basically have some form of the fundamental attribution error they look like they don't care, they're late, they're not dressed appropriately, they're sleepy, they look out the window. It's, it's, a, it's not easy to look at that behavior and read it correctly, I think, very often. The idea that this kid who showed up late and is staring out the window and is not prepared, didn't do his homework, et cetera, actually is dying to do well in school, doesn't come naturally. So I think it's a real challenge. And again, you know, brava that you, you, you know enough to see through it, but I think a lot of people don't. And I think the big challenge for us to transcend the initial impressions, which are often so negative, and realize there's something else going on. Um, but the example I always give of the classic attribution error is, you know, if I, if I lose patience with my daughter for a moment, uh, you know, it's because I haven't slept well and Trump is president and whatever. But if you do it, it's because you're a bad mom. That's how we think. And so to see through it is, not, is actually a real challenge. Uh, UBI, I, I'm a big fan of UBI. My only involvement so far has been to be on the board, sign a lot of petitions and be on the board of a couple of organizations in the US now that are trying UBI experiments. Having said that, I'm terribly worried about these studies for the following reason. The way they do these UBI studies is they randomly select families and give them basic income for however long. It's not you, it's not universal, it's a selected sample. And if you look at the lives of the poor, 
and understand them well enough, it's a real problem because they share and help each other much more than we do. When you give a random household basic income and the neighbor you don't, I guarantee you that they, will, they might try to hide it, but basically they'll share it. And so when you think you gave them 400 pounds, you will have given them 80. And what worries me is that it might not work, and then we'll, not, we'll never know why it didn't work. We'll think it didn't work because UBI doesn't work, because they spend their money irresponsibly, and we'll be profoundly wrong. It didn't work because they never got what you meant. If all of them had got 400, they'd look wonderful. But if you give 400 to one and the other four I'm sharing with, which they do all the time, a whole different story arises. And that's what worries me the most. I think UBI, if we could do it universal, even as a t trial, there was, you know, there's a Canadian city, there's a little bit of nice, you know, a little Icelandic, whatever. There is suggestions that it might work, but these experiments are ignoring something, I think largely driven by people who are running them not getting it. I'll give you another example. There's a standard critique in the US, uh, if you look at the lives of the poor in the Bronx, that they have debt that they cannot pay, yet they buy their kids little luxuries, little, you know, sneakers and candy, and it looks very irresponsible. If you look at the thing a little bit more carefully, you learn a whole other side of it that's very easy to miss. If I'm a mother of two in the Bronx and I finish the month with $70 in my pocket, I'm unbanked, I don't have a bank account, I have to go home with the $70, it's a question of five minutes before my boyfriend, my uncle, my mother, my sister need the money badly. The only way to save that money is to go and buy my kids sneakers. And so all of a sudden, the expenditure that looked completely irresponsible becomes a very wise way of using money which otherwise is immediately gone. And this is not unrelated to my concerns about what happens in UBI if you randomize it. But we're getting into technicalities here. But I, I think UBI is a perfect antidote to scarcity if we did it well. Okay, we can have one more question. This gentleman here. Oh, is there a, can you? Yep, can you? <laughs> You want to introduce yourself to us briefly? Thank you. Yeah, my name is Mac uh, McLaughlin. I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you very much. Um, a lot of what you described um, are, I suppose, to do with how individuals respond to structural uh, inequalities and how they might be helped to, to better respond. But perhaps an equally important question is what makes us feel that structural inequalities are okay? You know, what's our tolerance for inequality between people? And, and you know, maybe that's a, an important question for, for policy, the, the psychology of why people tolerate social uh, injustice. Agreed completely. I'm, I'm, I'm probably not the leading expert in this room on that topic. If you look at you know, human behavior in context, this is a question that's plagued us for a really long time. Uh, I think about it all the time. I mean, if you, walk, you, know, if you go on Broadway right now in New York to the theater, you have to step over homeless people. And my little girls are still stunned by this and try to understand what's going on. We are immune. And you know, you, you can see, I have a collection of photographs of extremely happy, um, radiant young women eating ice cream in a park. And then you learn that they're on a day off from running the ovens in Auschwitz. And it's mind boggling. And the point is that yes, we're organisms who get used to the context we're in. And next you know, we'll make the best of it. And the context, you know, if you look at Rwanda, changes overnight, and people act as if it's always been the world. And I to I'm, I'm with you. I think that's a, it's a drama we haven't solved, but it's, it's the meta problem of what we're talking about. I agree. Well, on that note. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, thank you very much. If you could join me in thanking Professor Shafir, thank you. Shafir, thank you.